Hi, I'm Stephen Powers, and I'm glad to be talking with you today. You might know me primarily as a poet. I have published three collections of poetry with salmon poetry in Ireland. The first one is called The Follower's Tale, and it was published ten years ago. A tenth anniversary edition came out this year. The second book I published with Salmon is Hello Stephen, which was published in 2014, and my most recent book was also published just this year, called All Seats, 50 Cent. But today I want to talk to you about my fiction. I'm especially excited about it because my first book of short stories was released just a few weeks ago through Closet Skeleton Press. The book is called Highway Speed, and I'm going to read you a part of a story that is called Fools of Nature. Fools of Nature Glenda wasn't looking forward to spending all night alone in her bath in a January Wisconsin blizzard. She drove north on the foreland in the middle of dark dairy country, not really knowing where she was. The snow blew up everywhere, up her motor coach's huge windshield, up in white dust devils over the highway sign, and over the road so that the road disappeared and reappeared again a few seconds later. The center line was gone, had been gone for an hour, but every now and then patches of black iced over pavement that looked like giant footprints appeared through the snow. Her CB radio sputtered and whooped, and once in a while only a garbled voice cut in. The wind and snow were driving away even the radio, and Glenda ached at the prospect of losing the warmth of those canned voices that burst through the chilly air of the empty bath. She'd forgotten her charging cable, how the console next to her lunch tote, an empty thermos, her phone, was dead. All the lights in the bus were off. The rearview mirror reflected only the first five rows behind her. After those, the rest disappeared in the dark. The defrosters weren't working. Her window was fogged up, and so were most of the windows on the bath. She wiped the windshield with her sleeve and made a small hole just big enough to see out. The rest of the windshield, as large as a blackboard, stayed fogged up. Glenda had turned off the heat. She was tired, as any sick dear old would be at the end of a long day driving, and she hoped that a chill would help keep her awake through the storm. There were warm gas stations and truck stops out there in the cold, somewhere. She pictured them buried in the snow as if they were pencil boxes, but she couldn't remember it having snowed that much in a long time. Maybe the global warming is real, she thought. Snow caked the letters on the big green highway sign. Her icy headlights didn't eliminate them anyway. She couldn't read the smaller blue signs either, the ones which could tell her where to find some relief and a snack. She thought about stopping and brushing some snow off one of those signs, but they were too tall. She hadn't brought any boots, either. She drove on, thinking if only those people talking about global warming really were right, praying they might be, praying that all of a sudden the atmosphere would cloud over like Venus and the sun's invisible stingers would inject themselves into earth and fly away all the snow caked on the highway sign so she could find her way home. If she kept following the pavement footprints in the snow, she would get there, eventually. She sighed and tightened her grip on the steering wheel. She wished she had a bigger coach, one of the fancy ones that wouldn't get on ice and snow, even if she were driving 90. Surely they made coaches like that, she thought. If science could create global warming, why couldn't it build a bus that wouldn't skid on ice and snow, even if she were driving 90? The group she'd driven down to O'Hare 
was a small group of about 20 people. Her company didn't need to send out the smaller coach very often, but on Glenda's assignment, the day of the January blizzard, they had. She passed a pickup truck stranded on the shoulder. Its hazard lights winked at her. Orange and red mushrooms bloomed across her foggy windshield and shrank away as if they'd been sucked up by a vacuum cleaner. The truck disappeared into the darkness behind her, and a car's lights ahead peeked from the flying snow. This vehicle was down in the ditch to the left. The car's front end was buried in a drift, and the back end was sticking out. It was a newer car, a luxury car, one with a huge back end, a fake tire well on the trunk. For the first time in a few hours, Glenda smiled. A gargled voice sliced the cold air inside the berth. Glenda felt a little better. She had no idea what the unseen fellow was saying, but he made her feel a little more relaxed. Made her think that staying out all night in the snow was perhaps a little more bearable. She felt her husband with her in the cold bus, in the cold emptiness. She listened to the windshield wipers squeak and the tires crunch. She was going only about 20 miles an hour, so the engine growled faintly from the back. Near the door, down in the footwell, a seat was folded up against the windshield an over-enthusiastic tour guide sometimes sat there, but now it was empty, like the thirty other seats on the bus. Her husband wanted to sit there, but she figured he could just sit in the row behind her. She wasn't going to pull over just to fold out the jump seat. Nice weather today, Frank she thought. There was no answer. He never answered her when he knew he'd been proven right. You were right. I should have told them I was sick today, she continued. Still no answer. She waited a few minutes. Say something, she thought. He could be so proud sometimes, stubborn too. She focused her attention back on the road if he was going to ignore her, then she was going to ignore him. Alright, that's all I'm going to read. You'll have to read the rest of the story in the book. Now, I get questioned a lot about where I get my ideas. I think that the first question that people tend to ask writers, and I always answer by talking about my influences instead. My first influence is probably the Gothic, especially Midwest Gothic and Southern Gothic. My favorite writers in the Southern Gothic especially are Flannery O'Connor, William Faulkner, Truman Capote, who is a Southern Gothic writer to some extent, Carson McCullers, and the playwright, Tennessee Williams. The Southern Gothic is stemmed off of the Gothic, which arose in popularity in 18th century England. And the Gothic could be characterized as Literature that has grandiose and bleak settings and passionate and destructive love, often violent action, and also a pervasive sense of decay. And the Southern Gothic borrows all of those elements from the English Gothic and puts it into a modernist context in the American South, usually to try to make some kind of point about a social issue relevant to the South. And the Midwest Gothic does more or less the same thing, borrows elements of the Gothic, puts them in the Midwest. The second place I draw inspiration from is magical realism. And magical realism is usually realistic depictions of everyday reality in literature, but there's something strange going on, something possibly otherworldly or supernatural too. But the people of the world in which this happened 
don't think anything of it. It's just a normal part of their everyday real life. And two of my favorite works of magical realism are The Handsomest Drowned Man in the World, a short story about a dead body that washes up on a beach near a fishing village, and A Hundred Years of Solitude. So if you want to learn more about Southern Gothic, start with Flannery O'Connor, and then read for magical realism, A Hundred Years of Solitude and The Handsomest Drowned Man in the World. Thank you very much. I'm Stephen Powers, and I hope you enjoy my work if you check it out.